Hello, Ibyamin. Hi, William Schwand. Hi, Ken Pratt. Great to have you here. Going to wait a little while longer. This is recorded, so if you have an objection to that, I suggest you remove yourself. So I haven't had a shave for about a week. <laughs> uh, there we go. I'm in this little apartment here in Hokkaido. And completely surrounded by boxes that weigh about nine kilos each. And trying to separate the pre-cold fusion work uh, from the cold fusion and ball lightning work. Um, it's been a tiring week. Um, I had great help from my friend and colleague here, Show, or Big Show, as he likes to be called now. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So the video you just saw came from a series of videos I didn't even know existed. And this is the particular cassette here. Cold Fusion Day at MIT, tape three from the first or uh, 21st of January 1995. And you can see Professor Peter Hegenstein. And it's quite amusing to see uh, Peter looking like a young man in this uh, video. James, Professor Keith Johnson, James L. Griggs on this particular cassette. And there are, in fact, four. One, two three, four, and they do not appear on the um, Infinite Energy website. And I can't find them on the internet. And it's just amazing. I first realized the importance of cavitation in my personal journey in 2017, when I was visiting Suhas Raukar in Mumbai, following my red pill presentation that I gave to the Indian Nuclear Authority. Uh, it's interesting because in this collection that uh, we have been reviewing here, there is the original, uh, where is it? It's over here. This document here, which I have over here, is co-authored by the guy that invited me to India, who since passed away, the great Mahadevan Shinavaza. And this particular document is the first six months, April to September 1989, of the Barbara Atomic uh, Research Centre's research into cold fusion. Here, I think this is the exposed plate that they had, uh, which showed that something interesting was going on. And yeah, this was published in 1989 and it is a review of uh, the work at the Bubba Atomic Research Center. I didn't even know this existed. There is an incredible wealth of materials here that I did not know existed. And it's going to take, probably it's a full-time job for a year to process all of this. Um, uh, at the moment, we are finding a way to ship it. And uh, I think that has been resolved. Um, but uh, we need to do the job properly. It even has uh, in his collection, I think I've I found a, a video uh, on previously in some of the videos over here in that heap over there. Um, where he is looking at... Um, crop circles, and he was very, very interested in crop circles. Uh, one of the other videos there, and there's not many videos other than these cold fusion ones, his own experiments and the crop circle one, um, there is this, which is a tape completely full of propaganda from one year after 9-11. So I think it's going to be interesting to publish this, and 
uh, I think I might call it uh, What is Truth? Very, very fascinating to see that material uh, coming off the production line. Now, what I also have here, before we start to talk about Griggs, is if people do want to support this, um, I'm going to auction off these last five copies of the original Matsumoto print run of his book, Steps to the Discovery of Electronuclear Claps. You might have seen me wave my copy that was sent to me a few years ago um, in front of the camera, but these are the last five copies that exist. Um, so there's that. And um, we are going to auction off some things. So basically, basically uh, we, we have permission from the family to, you know, um, obviously the aim is to produce a, a color version of the book. And I can tell you that's going to be possible uh, because uh, we have, unbelievably, it would appear every nuclear film, every um, uh, SEM image, uh, and when I say SEM image, uh, so here's just one pack of very many, so SEM here, and in there we actually have the negatives in large format of the SEMs here. So here you go, this very famous SEM here, we have the negative of that uh, that you see in the book. So I will be able to scan these with my 96,000 or 9,600 DPI scanner at 48 bit, or rather that will be 16 bit or grayscale. And we will be able to produce images never, uh, I would thought never possible uh, without this material and remaster the book. We've already written, uh, myself and Philip Power, the entire book, corrected the English and it's all in uh, reformatable text. Um, and then to be able to add in lots of extra papers, maybe in a secondary book, uh, with things like this, a theory of predicting earthquake by, by microball lightning. Uh, microball lightning observed during earthquakes near, uh, it says, uh, Kujushima Island. And this is something, a pack like this, uh, we would be um, auctioning off. I've captured all of this material already, but uh, we just hit a wall because we realized this is just going to take many months to do. Um, and so uh, uh, we, we, we've got to, you know, basically ship it and stuff. So here, I think you'll all like this. This is the Hanshin Awaji earthquake during January the 17th, 1995. So uh, this is just before Griggs gave his presentation there in MIT in uh, just a week before. And look at this. This is coming out of the ground and into the air. It's like a huge strange radiation coming out in a helical beam into the sky. Absolutely incredible. Um, this collection from Matsumoto, uh, uh, you, you kind of, uh, you got to avoid getting emo emotional about it because the idea that this might have been lost to history um, uh, is is just a thought not worth even thinking. Um, but really, it's uh, I have to thank Joe, who's hiding on the floor here. That he wants to keep a low profile. <laughs> um, <laughs> not just physically low, but low actually. Um, uh, because uh, with him, we managed to build this relationship with Matsumoto. And uh, he got inspired to write a second book. And in that process... He actually has been organizing since we first reached out to him at late 2019, early 2020, I think it was, uh, whenever it might be a year out then. Um, but anyway, he had organized all of his work and, and, and organized other material for this potential second book. And, uh, you know, everything's organized in a way that no one could possibly have ever been able to do in any other way. 
other things we'll be looking to auction off uh, to help support um, the archiving of this is things like this. And this is the way he worked. He actually would take color microscopy images uh, into a photo capturing device on the camera. He would then develop the photos and then stitch them together like this. Okay. And so, uh, you know, there are some breathtaking images, okay, of some of the things that he found. And I would, we found a good proportion of the ones that are in the book that are just unreadable black and white. Um, but here we go. So th these are actually photos, and he's painstakingly connected these together. Okay. Painstakingly connected them together. And then he would take another photo of this, uh, and then you know, if he needed to scale it down or whatever, but he would put the scale on these things. So um, these things will be up for grabs. Um, and I, I think personally, they are actual works of art uh, um, in a way that they, they are unique one-offs. These are literally the work of Matsumoto in developing uh, his understanding of uh this technology so you can see here the photos snapped together and he would put the scale on there and then th this is this is how he built things up um you know here's another one in black and white here you know how many photos and painstakingly arranging these and bonding them into position here we go okay so there's going to be some opportunities here to uh possess um artwork effectively <laughs> from his i mean look at this look at this look at this they're photos and they are the sort of carbon filament traces same sort of thing that we observed in binger and huang's dhx2 reactor more recently uh just just really rather special okay so um i'm gonna let you guys if you want to pitch in right now so for those that came in later uh we have the original which i didn't know even existed and it, i couldn't find it on um the uh infinite energy website but they are these are vi these videos from 1995 and also we have the set from 1996 MIT and uh, seeing people on these like Hal Fox. I, I'd never seen Hal Fox before and it's an absolutely fascinating uh, uh, presentation he gives. Christopher P. Tinsley, uh, the guy that I've referred to interviewing, um, uh, interviewing Martin Fleischmann way back in the day, uh, where he revealed that they were working on four different things, one of them being what turned out to be cold fusion. Um, and so also, no surprise uh, who a lot of these people work for. Um, and, and also, you know, there's documents here. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> there's, there's documents here. Right, so... Um, I'm going to give people a chance to uh, pitch in to see what they got out of the presentation. And, uh, you know, and then I'm going to talk about the things that st stood out to me with my immediate look through it, uh, which I'm going to get here. I've got some notes here on a different thing. So this is a bit different. I'm, I haven't got all my normal equipment to do streaming and restreaming. So this is not going to be live to the web. So you have to be here. So uh, anyone got any chat comments? You can, you can, you can comment in the chat if you want, and I can pick it up there. Um, so does anyone want to say hello first off? Uh, and and then otherwise we'll go no. into what I have. Go ahead. Ra raise your hand and I'll call on you. So down the bottom, you can go to reactions or whatever, and you can raise hand, something like that. Anyone? Okay. Okay, Joe, go for it. Hello, everybody here. This is Gerald from Winnipeg Enlightened from Truth 2. I love to experiment and 
I'm I just love the way Bob's been putting things together. And I'm very interested in learning as much as you can throw out there, Bob. I just wanted to say that. So thank you for your work. It's amazing. And hello, everyone out there. Well, it's very much a, a collective effort. Um, like I say, absolutely, this relationship would not have been built without the tireless efforts of my colleague here and friend uh, show. So um, and that's just one example of how this is all teamwork. Um the the sheer volume of material to process here, I I don't know. It's just like I I'm thinking of putting together a time toast um timeline and and as things emerge, dumping it on there so people can see how he evolved. But you can see in some of the boxes where he he studied all of the properties of you know how neutrons. He, there's books in here from 1954 on uh neutron optics right there are books on i've got one here so for instance this one here let me find it uh this one here it looks pretty innocuous like this right and uh what has it got in it uh uh st structure of atomic motion in glasses uh so you know that's one book then then there's this book here again just got some japanese on the front and whatever and so we have a look in the middle in the inside of here and it says the physical society of japan has the pleasure of presenting this issue of, of the series of selected paper papers in physics this present volume contains papers in the field of neutrino reactions <laughs> i thought they didn't react <laughs> there you go the first paper is by Feynman the second bit is by Weinberg uh, and as as you go through there you go it's like pages and pages and pages of uh, the science of neutrino reactions <laughs> um, <laughs> alright so uh, yeah it's, it's, it's an incredibly special archive um, okay so uh, yeah, it feels like Christmas at Vanilla Ice this year. And thank you for your uh, donation. We will use it for coffee in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> everyone, everyone buys their stuff at that the uh, convenience stores in Japan. In fact, it's the same in Taiwan a lot. Um, uh, yeah. Anyway, all right. So the first thing I will I, I picked out, uh, uh, which is a kind of a global thing from uh, what Grig said there. And, I'm not sure, but it would appear that Griggs was still applying for patents in August 2022, but it looks like he might have passed away this year, early this year. So if that's the case, I'm sorry to his family, unless that was his father, and I'm still sorry to him. But it, he, it's it's the right name with all the right letters, and it's in Rome and uh, Georgia, so you know it's the right place. Uh, yes. Okay. So, um, you know, for the books that are out of copyright or whatever, I mean, you cannot even begin to imagine what's here. You just can't. Um, and also, like, there's 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 a Christmas card, I think it is, a greetings card, and it has a photo in there, and I'm looking at show now, and it had two 3D models in there, and I immediately recognised it. I said, that's from Dyke House right and he opened it up and he goes uh, seasons greetings or what else blah 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 um dyke house and it's it, you know it's his borromean rings and, and and stuff for the model of the interlacing strings in in ball lightning and dyke house as you know we talked about his uh 2001 paper um and other papers that he wrote um so there's that and uh there's another letter from uh yuji bajatov uh uh, sending the proceedings of, I think, the seventh uh, cold nuclear transmutation and ball lightning conference. Of course, he organized it for 25 years um, uh, before he died in 2018. And it's signed off by Yuji Bajatov, this guy, which was an absolute giant in the field in the Soviet Union, and then in Russia. Ready? Uh, hello, Alex, did you, you want to say something? Yeah. Huh? Okay, I'm going to mute him. 
All right. So uh, the first thing I wanted to say is that, firstly, it was it was a bit of a shock to see Eugene Malov in in these videos. Uh, however, having looked at um, the Infinite Energy site, there is actually a section on, on Eugene Malov, and the, the opening statement that he gives, I believe, is actually in these videos. Is actually there, but like I say, none of these really important video uh, or some of them important videos are, are are available on the web but that section is and i do encourage people to go and have a look at what or listen to what he says really very very interesting and so prescient you know <laughs> at one point he said and i think what i'll do is i i will cut like um you know this this format uh, of um video uh for the mfmp youtube channel because he says something like, I think one day people are going to uh, discover that, uh, you know, cold fusion explains, you, you know, the, how the whole universe works or something like that. It's like, no, I think you might be right, Eugene. Uh, and, and so on. And he, he makes some really profound statements. Uh, and yeah, there we go. All right. So back to Griggs or focusing on Griggs, he says... Um, I found one thing that was very fascinating. He said that was there was no real sales in his business uh, uh, until they removed their over unity claim. You know, no one was interested in helping him or investing in him until uh, he removed the over unity claim. And I think, you know, in the 1996 video, he claims they've sold many thousands of units. So. Uh, and there must have been some success in that business because that's kind of basically what he looks like he did for the rest of his uh, given days. Um, so there's something you can learn there where, you know, sometimes uh, uh, it's the, the, the thing that you think is the most important thing to claim about something isn't the most important thing to claim. Um, you know, and, and, maybe it claiming that there's some kind of kind of nuclear reaction and we don't really know what it is is actually a, a bit of a problem uh, uh for people accepting something and using it so um, i think we can learn something from that i think uh, current technology being discussed could probably learn from that and uh so that was one so i'm going to go through a whole series of things that i picked out from the video so the first one was he said he saw uh, melting of aluminium, or rather when they analysed this rotor that was running under a specific conditions, not actually for that very long, and they took it out, and that's the one he was showing in the presentation. He said he saw that when they analysed it, an expert said that it, the aluminium had, had been melted uh, and it had been welded back together. And he said that to melt the grade of aluminium used, aluminium used, it would have had to have exceeded 1200 degrees Fahrenheit. And well, that's pretty obvious because the melting point of aluminium is 1221 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's reasonable. He then goes on to say uh, that to have it welded back together, it would have had to have exceeded 4000 degrees Fahrenheit. This is interesting because I thought, well, obviously aluminium doesn't need to be, have, what do you mean welded aluminium? It's melted. It would just solidify. But then I thought, well, maybe he means that it, it become aluminium oxide and then it's been deoxidized and, and and put back into being aluminium and deposited again. And in that case, he's saying 4,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, the melting point of aluminium oxide is 3,762 degrees Fahrenheit. And given the fact that, you know, you've got a third party telling him a temperature and then he's counting that from the top of his head and it's all ballpark then I think it's reasonable to say that what there was suggestion was it's they, they're re remaking uh, metal uh, from the aluminium oxide. Now, I immediately thought when he said that, would it be simply fluidized by the fractal toroidal moment of the EVOs? Because we know that they are being produced in the cavitation system. And Hutchison, you know, saw aluminium turn to jelly and uh, uh and in the case of ken shoulders he was able to fluidize aluminium oxide so both observations the fluidizing at below expected temperatures of aluminium and fluidizing uh, of aluminium oxide observed by ken shoulders and uh, uh sorry uh, uh, john hutchison and ken shoulders um respectively one 
in fact, I guess both of those came before Griggs made that presentation. And probably both of those came before Griggs ever observed that. So this is kind of retrospectively um, supporting the observations of both Hutchison and Ken Shoulders in a presentation that, like I say, I, I've been talking about uh, uh, cavitation being probably the fastest way to demonstrate the Lerner effect, in part because it probably produces HHO and a lot of Lerner processes are actually just HHO in disguise, in, in my view, um, and for whatever's going on in that dynamic. And so it was, it, it's interesting because um, effectively his work is supporting other work that, according to Ken Shoulders, is probably the same thing that's going on in Lena. Uh, so that there's that. Then the second one, he said, um, he mentioned that the steam coming out was uh, blue. And this is absolutely incredible to me because this is a prior observation of the same thing that Bin Zhen Huang et al. has observed with his water turning blue. Now, I ask, is this because uh, Griggs had also made heavy oxygen water? And by heavy oxygen water, I mean that the oxygen in there is not predominantly 16. It's uh, uh, a reasonable uh, proportion is oxygen 17. And could it be that oxygen 17 in heavy water has a slightly different bond length or slightly different uh, electronic excitation de-excitation or absorption spectrum such that it presents itself as blue if that's the case then that would explain both that which i physically saw i literally saw the blue water in taipei the first time i visited uh, uh last christmas um and on the 29th of uh december actually last year uh, and uh, he's saying that the steam is blue. So for the steam to be blue, really the light absorption, I mean, basically what it's doing is it's reflecting some blue. <laughs> now, of course, the sky is blue because it's the light that doesn't get absorbed. I think that, that's what it is. Um, so would it be that they're the same thing in the water? Maybe. I don't. Oh, no, um, obviously we've argued that the production of seventeen oxygen is because the kinetics involved uh, far exceed a thousand degrees centigrade in condensed matter. So condensed matter can be plasma, which seems a bit weird, but it, it, condensed matter, plasma is actually condensed matter. Yeah. Um, uh, gas, liquid, and so on. If you have um, uh, that hitting together with the kinetics that you get at over a thousand thousand degrees and above, you get a neutrino and an anti-neutrino of the ultra low uh, momentum uh, cold neutrino form, and the anti-neutrino side of that is uh, able to, um, in my view, uh, and under the theory of Alexander Parkhamov, cause an electron and a proton uh, to fuse simultaneously with a 16 oxygen to produce 17 oxygen, okay? So uh, could, could he have been pre-finding this out, but of course never considered this could be, could it be because of the production of heavy, heavy oxygen water? Is it a signature of, of the production of heavy oxygen water, or is it a signature of structured water or some other phenomena? So... Maybe those guys that have got more experience in structured water, um, maybe they could find out whether structured water has been found to have a blue tinge to it. Uh, and, and it might be because maybe the way the structured water has been made, that it actually has uh, oxygen, heavy oxygen water in there. I don't know. Now, he also said that water becomes aerated no matter what he did with it, right? Water became aerated no matter what you did with it. Now, he said there was loads of bubbles in there. And could this be the same as the production of non-condensable gases such as CO2 uh, and 22 neon, uh, as in the observation of Binger and Huang uh, uh, in his heat generator? 
If so, it's another pre-verification or pre-replication, if you can call it, of the work of Bin Zhen Huang. Um, absolutely fascinating to me. And then he, then he points out, and, and you might have recalled it, he says, and right here, it's almost like it was shot with a bullet. And I'm asking myself, uh, could this be a hemispherical section that was instantly cut out of the metal, as in the Hutchison effect, uh, where if you've seen a, a, a iron billet was cut in half uh, and inside that iron billet there were spherical uh, sections cut out. Of course, Matsumoto observed inside a palladium uh, deuterated uh, deuterium oxide uh, experiment when he cut the reactor open, there was spherical holes cut out inside the structure and also... Uh, Hank Urian saw in the copper pipe in the Baker experiment a spher spherical pieces cut out of the copper pipe. Could this be effectively a pre-replication of um, uh, those findings? Of course, in the case of Hutchison, this would be post-verification. Uh, so uh, I thought that was utterly, utterly fascinating. Um, and as I have said before i think this is where the non-radiating uh coherent matter double layer is, is so excited and it's got so high concentration of like smaller evos trying to get in join the big evo that they cut out instantaneously um the uh uh this sp these spherical sections he had no explanation for it um he he then I mean, there was a video of the steam coming out. And of course, you know, I've argued that ball lightning going into a barrel of water could be with the same coherent matter sort of attached uh, structures on the outside. Could they be causing the um, conversion to water gas of water because of the disruption beam coming out of those structures as we know they do and you can see them you can see them in various like the the, the marks on the um silicon dioxide you can see them uh, in that cut area where you have those disrupted sections of copper could it be that those little twisting tendrils that come out of the structure they are interfering with the, the way the I are, uh, the polar bonds hold the water molecules together and could it be producing steam um, through this disruption beam in the same way that I, I think the Great Pyramid produces uh, water gas uh, from its oval structure as part of the overall process that leads to the production of uh, etheric matter streams and, and the whole functioning of the Great Pyramid. So, um, you know, Essentially, the exotic vacuum object is appearing to change the electronic properties of the material. And this would increase the pressure because you, the, the water molecules can't bind to each other. Uh, they become a gas and they occupy, uh, I think it's 1,617 times more volume than um, is uh, occupied by water. Um, then he talks about the system is able to remove uh, water from salt water and uh, water from ethylene glycol. And so you, they're effectively taking ethylene glycol that's been mixed with water uh, as, a, I guess, an antifreeze mixture with water. And then they're able to extract the water and then reconcentrate the ethylene glycol and that can be reused. I thought that was absolutely fascinating because, again, it speaks to this being able to interact with the water molecule polar bonds. And this could also be a uh, sort of pre-verification of what's going on in the wind hex. Because I argue part, part of the desiccation of material in the wind hex is because of this disruption of the overall uh, structure on the ability of water to bind uh, with other water molecules and possibly with other um, you know, things. Uh, just literally kind of boiling, but it's not boiling. Uh, and, that, and and also when you see tornadoes with, you know, water coming out of things, I think it's kind of somehow binding into water or maybe it's somehow grabbing the oxygen out of it or whatever. It's it's doing something there. 
So does anyone, before I go on to, uh, I have quite a few other points. Does anyone want to have a conversation on any of that? I say, I've got Ken Pratt saying, uh, please give Sho our great thanks for his help, even if he wants to lay low. So Sho, thank you very much. <laughs> he, he's bowing his head in typical uh, modest Japanese style. So yes, uh, uh, it's been very ple great pleasure to work with him over the years here. Um, uh, maybe the steam is highly charged up electrically, possibly. Uh, Gerald is saying, hey, Bob, I recently completed a high voltage experiment with a geometrical coil on aluminum case grounded outside the room that drained all the batteries in the room and lowered the temperature of the aluminum to a point where, when touched, almost burned the fingertip of my hand from the cold. Any thoughts? Uh, no, but I would very much like to see the experiment. <laughs> um, uh, not, not, not immediate thoughts, uh, other than uh, nice to make something go cold. Uh, Alex Del Castillo, I've made the chill water on my still glow blue magnets and vortexing and falling from height. Very interesting, Alex. Thank you for sharing that. What are the Parkamov results from aluminium plus aluminium plus H plus O? Cobalt blue? Um, aluminium plus aluminium. Um, aluminium plus aluminium is nearly, yeah, it could be something like that. Plus O? I don't know whether it'd be. Um, no, I don't know whether it would be cobalt blue. I think, well, <laughs> um, Benjamin Huang has been drinking that water in his laboratory for, you know, a very long time <laughs> since they've been producing it for many years. Um, I, I think if he was drinking any amount of cobalt, that none of them would be alive. <laughs> okay. It's it's not a very good thing to have in your body. Um, blue steam, Corky says, a, a new kid on the end block. Okay. Does anyone have any comments on what I've said so far and thoughts. If not, I will go on. Uh, so Gerald says, William, I wonder if the water becomes polarized. Uh, um, maybe that's it. Maybe that, maybe it's uh, somehow polarized. Yes. And that does the, the blueness. Don't know. Something's going on. But what I'm saying is whatever... You have one cavitation system of Griggs in this unknown video, at least unknown to me, and I can't see how anyone else would have known it that wasn't in that room <laughs> because the video hasn't been available <laughs> um, or very close to, to Griggs. So, um, and I literally saw blue water uh, when I was with Bin Chen Huang and he pointed out, and you can go and see the video where he points out that it was blue. <laughs> so... You know, this is this is very interesting to me because both systems are based on extreme cavitation. OK, so I'm going to go on. Uh, so. This is very interesting to me and reminds me of the Vichayev experiments, which clearly are going to be producing exotic vacuum objects. And it says when you put heavy metallized water in it, it actually causes a bonding between some of the metals and they become heavy enough so that they precipitate out of the water and you can collect them. Now, Vichayev, if you go and look at the Vichayev patterns, they have water or, or gas flowing around the system and then they have a magnetic um, uh, like pinch type coil with uh, electric discharges in the sort of center of that. And they say they're synthesizing metals or they're certainly producing metal precip precipitates out of the um, contaminated water um, and so uh, this is very similar kind of claim to that but I then go on to say uh, is this the same as the magnetic metals come sorry non-magnetic metals becoming magnetic as in the Hutchison effect right or in the Swedish Windhex implementation so if you remember the the before um, Kraft Foods International bought the Windex patents of Frank Polivka, there was a Swedish company that actually bought a license to produce these things, and the website is still there. And one of the properties that they find is that you can use this to separate metals uh, from mixed waste because the metals become magnetic, uh, even if they're not magnetic. And so they have a picture on their website as one of the things that it does. So, you know, if you have a metal, a metal 
any metal can capture these structures. And the structures themselves have a magnetic property. And so um, is this effectively another uh, uh, pre-verification of what's going on in the wind hex because it's all based on the same uh, uh, underlying process? Um, so I said, is this uh, because the metals in the water are... Uh, oh, sorry, is this because magnetic structures are being captured in the metals in the water or... Is it because of intense magnetic fields in the Ebo's fractal moment that captures and aggregates ferro and paramagnetic materials from water into clusters? Um, and so are some of the metals being synthesized? So maybe he's actually synthesizing some of these metals that are supposedly uh, precipitating out. And I asked the question, as you would expect I would do, if we were to have examined the precipitated metals that came out of his system when treating heavy metallized water, would he have seen iron-rich crenelated microspheres if he examined the precipitates? I think he probably would, uh, especially since he's using an iron rotor. Uh, he then goes on to say that he's able to capture the nickel, which we all know is ferromagnetic, out of nickel plating wash baths. And therefore, uh, they can purify the water so that they can reuse the same water uh, for washing more uh, nickel uh, in the process of nickel plating. So, you know, it really does point to the fact that some magnetic uh, capture is going on. And I would refer to the presentation by Shishkin in response to Benjamin Huang's paper, where he is saying that there was a large num amount of metal transferred from one part of his cavitator to another implying intense magnetic fields in fact no he he actually said it was intense currents uh, that it implies but i think it's actually intense uh, magnetic fields that are going on okay he then says there was some kind of exposure of holes on the outside of the rotor and so uh, in he was considering putting a film on to see if it got exposed is this, and, and I refer you back to what I showed you earlier, the Babaratomic Research Center uh, for the start of cold fusion, where they actually have these exposed X-ray film. And that was one of their major findings uh, in the uh, first six months at Babaratomic Research Center when looking into cold fusion. Is that kind of same thing going on? But they, they're not saying, you know, this isn't necessarily X-rays. Could this be, therefore... Um, because uh, they're effectively evidence of uh, the interaction of strange radiation or coherent matter waves, neutral EVOs, or magnetotoral electrical radiation. These are all sort of, sort of the same kind of thing, but given different names. Um, uh, of course, the, in the cavitation experiments of Shishkin from 2009 onwards, in his uh, uh, device, he was able to expose x-rays outside of the device and that's how he came to learn about the birdies and that's how he came to uh, realize that these things magnetotor electrical radiation i mean magnetotor electrical clusters neutral and uh, charged exotic vacuum object equivalents uh, in his terminology uh, were being emitted from an intensely cavitating structure I would argue 100% yes. If he had put radiographic plates on there, he would have observe, observed something that wasn't quite expected to be caused by X-rays, but would have trapped themselves into uh, um, uh, silver uh, uh, um, particles in the radiographic material. So there's that. Uh, and then this is incredibly funny for me because i've just been in uh taipei before coming here and that it was to review what's going on with binjo and huang and to give them a whole series of ideas which i've talked with you in the past but specifically to him and i will walk through all of these uh with the community uh, uh greater community um and that is systems and, and approaches for ex, 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 uh, increasing the excess heat from his reactor, okay? And one of the things I suggested is to include some potassium salt. The reason is 
is because if you have a neutrino coming out, you're going to be losing that energy. Why would you have a neutrino coming out? If you remember what I said earlier, when you have an impact of condensed matter, that is a plasma, that is a liquid, that is a solid of over a thousand degrees centigrade, the kinetic energy embedded in that kind of impact, that, that kind of thermal temperatures, then you get the formation, according to Parkamol, of uh, ultra low momentum, uh, cold, relic neutrino equivalent, uh, and anti-neutrino equivalent. The reaction to produce 17 oxygen, which appears to be confirmed, is using the anti-neutrino. That would leave 0.25 electron volts of neutrino, cold neutrino, ultra-low momentum neutrino, just walking through the reactor and being lost. And that is 100% loss because you are putting energy in to create that neutrino anti neutrino pair okay and you might not think that 0.25 of an ev is a lot but the most powerful chemical reaction there is is between atomic hydrogen and atomic hydrogen to make uh, molecular hydrogen and that is 4 ev so you only need to lose 16 of those cold neutrinos to be able to get uh, to be able to lose the equivalent of one of the most powerful or, or the most powerful chemical uh, yield you can get right so it's not to be sniffed at and if these things are being produced by the trillions you're losing a lot of your potential heat in that way now what if you could have the most unstable primordial isotope in the reactor or around the reactor and that would be potassium 40 that has a half-life if we believe there was a big bang of about one third of the length of the universe right <laughs> if we have that we get this huge much more than one mega electron volt yield and because it's an inverse beta reaction where the neutrino comes in and forces the beta out you do not get the spread spectrum because you do not have the neutrino to uh, share the energy with from the uh, uh, beta decay. And so you get Emax, you get all of the energy in the beta particle that is produced. And so that is one point, whatever it is, five, whatever, 1.3 or something, I can't remember offhand, uh, million electron volts of that. It's, well, sorry, it is 1.31 million electron volts. And because it's a beta particle, it's not going to be able to able to um, you know fully escape the reactor without thermalizing. Okay, so um, you know you can stop a beta particle with a because it's physically large uh, with a sheet of paper. Okay, so that's going to thermalize in the reactor. So I was suggesting adding some sort of potassium salt to the fluid uh, as one test and add some maybe potassium. Uh, chloride or something on the outside of the reactor as a secondary material in the way that Parkamov has been doing in tests over the last couple of years. Parkamov actually says that he thinks that potassium is, is the fuel of the future uh, uh, in this way. Um, I thought I was thinking of something new when I was working with his book as I was working through it. I thought, oh, you could use potassium. And then I find later in his book, he actually literally suggests that. Um, so, uh, and so, it was with great surprise, uh, uh, but not, that when he, he says Jed, and I, I, I presume he means Jed Rothwell, who runs the Lenacana.org site, he suggested adding potassium carbonate to the water as a Lena experiment, right? Now, I don't know where Jed was coming from that. Obviously, potassium carbonate is a very common uh, electrolyte used in Lenner experiments. So he might, he, I, and of course, this theory by Parkamov wasn't developed at that time, mm -hmm. but uh, it's there in the record that he's saying add potassium carbonate to a cavitation system, okay? Uh, without an explanation, no details to why he was being advised that. Uh, but anyway, here we have a situation where I literally leave a few days ago from Bin Zhen Huang advising him to put potassium salts as amongst other things into or around his reactor to capture very specifically the 0.25 EV 
uh, from the otherwise unused neutrino, not the anti-neutrino that gets used to make the 17 oxygen, the neutrino, and uh, uh, turn that 0.25 of an electron volt guaranteed loss into potentially a, a number of 1.31 million electron volts gain, which could be thermalized because it's a beta particle. So, um, and then I, I, I see this in this presentation that you saw, which was from 1995, um, and it says, uh, in the last week of May 2024, I suggested adding potassium salts to Binjirin Huan's reactor to capture what would otherwise be 100% lost 0.25 EV of energy and cavitation impact produced ultra low energy neutrinos that could be used to force the inverse beta decay or 40K, which would yield an energy max beta of 1.31 mega electron volts, which would then be thermalized. So there we go. That's that. Then, uh, last one. One, uh, Gene Mallow requested Griggs add a small percentage of heavy water to the pump and supplied it for the test. Uh, and he said that it added uh, around about 3 to 4% extra output. Uh, uh, but unfortunately, that's within the margin of error. But it is a net positive. It, you know, the, the, the margin of error wasn't 3 to 4% less. It was 3 to 4% more. And the uh, show reminded me that uh, it was him that suggested that Roy Shinomaza added uh, uh, some uh, uh, deuterium to his experiments. Right, Joe? <laughs> He's nodding his head. <laughs> okay, so um, that's that's my initial thoughts on this incredible presentation. And I cannot believe it's out there in the world because since 2022, when I gave my uh, ultra experimentation, uh, sorry, my ultra presentation in Azizi to a good proportion of the the Western Lena researchers, uh, no one, no one, and that video has been viewed a, a lot more than many other videos, no one has shared this presentation. So I don't know why it wasn't public, but thanks to the diligence of Taka Akimatsumoto, uh, that was uh, uh, carried forward till this week and we've been able to share it with you today and um, like I say I said to show earlier today I always prefer to find unpublished previous work or unrecognized or, uh, or undiscussed previous work that supports current findings than uh, almost verification of current findings it's it's almost I, th I find it more um you know uh, uh, more stronger verification to find that it's already been found and so you know with that i have to you know again thank you takaki matsumoto that for me is worth the price of the ticket what is in that video uh, and now fully out there for people to recognize by griggs is itself worth the price of the ticket and the time and the effort to come here. Everything else is a bonus. And my God, what a lot of bonuses there are. So if you want to ask a question, if you've got anything to say, uh, let me know. Fire away now. Raise your hand. Anyone? Okay, Ken, Ken's got a comment here. Uh, uh, okay, Alex, do you want to go? Go for it. Sorry, I'm at work. Yeah, uh, sorry, I'm at work. Um, okay. Yeah, one thing, I, I've been thinking about this water hammer thing for the last few weeks, so there's an interesting synchronicity there. Uh, the one thing I would suggest, whether we're talking about... Um, something like this or or even something along the lines of the Thunderbolt reactor is when we design these experiments, design them tunably, uh, maybe with like a slide kind of like on a French horn if you're using something with tubing or, you know, when we, when we build these, because I, I think, think it's going to be a matter of just getting the right resonance for whatever the material is and, and the shape of everything and just fooling around with it. Um, apropos of that, like I said, I... I made the water glow in my still. I was running a still and I had Schauberger on my mind. And I'm like, well, let's just try and duplicate the hydrologic cycle. So I basically put a corium pump and some ice and some crystals and some rocks and some magnets and made a little waterfall and ran it as I was running the still. And lo and behold, 
it started to glow blue. I mean, it was subtle, but it was definitely there. I, mean, I tell you guys, I wouldn't tell it to all the people, but I mean, that came up. So if that's a confirmation that inspires you guys, um, you know, it's in the air and we all kind of have a group mind in a sense. So uh, I just thought I'd contribute that. Yeah, thanks for putting that out there. I think it's very important to people that share these genuine experiences because, you know, sometimes these things can be lost uh, just because someone thinks, oh, is that real? You, you know, um, but I, I can tell you 100% that the water looked blue, unusually blue in in the water that came out of of the uh, system from Bin Chen Huang. And so it just kind of like made me chuckle, I think. Show can understand why okay, every, every couple of seconds. Every couple of seconds, I was, um, go on, go on. The rum was really, the rum was really good too. By the way, I mean, the rum that came out of that still was delicious. And uh, my, really? my working theory, my working theory, and you know, having gone deep down the Schauberger rabbit hole and grander water and all that stuff, is I think that if you have, for lack of a better term, structured water in the chill water it imparts some kind of frequency or or morphogenic field or whatever you want to call it on the water as it condenses in in the in the condensate the, the rum you know whatever it yeah, is yeah, yeah. Um, and, and they have had these things like that affect the uh um the way that dough rises in bread when they install them in bakeries and all and I, i'm i'm a i'm a chef i mean that's what that's what i do for a living right now <laughs> this and and what we're talking about here but I mean, I literally wash dishes and look at the vortex going down the drain, and I see things, you know, and, and I figure this out. Because it's telling us everything is fractal. It's the tech manual is nature. And if we're smart enough yeah. to look at it the right way and loosen our minds up and really look at it and, and be like get rid of our preconceptions, but also look at those weird things that happened in the background. Uh, you know, that blue water, I didn't quite believe it when I saw it, but it was always in the back of my mind. But I mean, I saw it. But it's one of those things that's easy yeah. to set aside. If you've been, you know, I'm a damn, I was trained as a nuclear engineer, yada, yada, yada. So, you know, in the back of your mind, is all this indoctrination. But you, you see it. And that, you know, another one that I saw, sorry for the rant, but I grew up in Florida. There's this famous picture of a uh, a palm tree with a two by four sticking out of it. And the implication was right. that it was, you know, it was rammed there by the force of the wind. And I mean, I don't care how hard and how fast a two by four goes into it. What you saw there yeah. is something like a hush. It's a Hutchinson effect. And I'll bet if we cut that apart, yeah. you'd see the same thing. And so, look, we know this. There's there's no denying that. And here we are. You know, we don't have it perfect, but we definitely are on, on the right track. And we're at the point where we can start, we used to call it the Navy Easter egg, and just trying stuff until something happens, and then back into the theory about what's going on. That's exactly what we're doing here. Yeah. And it's out. Honestly, and that, that is it. And, it. and And I was saying to show, you know, it's it's rare to find people that actually do. There's a lot lot of people that are talking, um, but you know Matsumoto was a person that did, and meticulously documented what he did, and that is another rarity on top of a rarity. Uh, and and I was saying also about the problem that people have faced in the past, um, which is also today that there's a number of people I would absolutely love oh. have working on a collective project to take this science forward. But, you know, th th there's two main ca categories, like people that can't work together and uh, people that have families but could work together, but like they, they've got to live in their country, don't they? So how do you work together? So we've, we've got to find a way to solve this where we can actually get this, this delivered uh, and somehow do it with us all across the world, right? And and that, that takes people tinkering and sharing and, and genuinely doing it um and so you know I, I i'll do what i can in in every res respect that that i can do it um and um you know sh share your experience that that's that's all right uh, since i got you guys here i'll share one more i think i've mentioned it before back in the 80s before i went into the navy i was i was a hot rodder and i was swimming around with my car and I don't know, I pulled this out of my ass, but I was trying to do stoichiometric, I figured the stoichiometric efficiency of gasoline in the engine, you know, we're not getting enough. So I thought I'd vaporize the gas. Long story short, I came, I had headers on it. They were um, steel aluminized headers. And I wrapped it with, with copper tubing and pulled 
pressurized fuel, gasoline, it's crazy, I know, but it worked, through the copper tubing on the hot header and ran the engine and it had the weird fog and it had way more power than it should have for like symbols full of fuel. And looking back at it now, I think those coils were D4D just by chance, but I mean, right, there's right. no chance. But, but, and it was copper and it was iron and it was total thunderstorm generator going because you got the heat from the cylinder head coming out and you've got the intake air. And if, if we're getting air in there, you know, maybe something to do with the copper oxide inside doing the little things to set up. I, I don't know. I mean, this really happened. It's something to throw in the thing. I think there may be another uh, structure for a thunderstorm generator type system utilizing that geometry. Um, cause, you know, there's not, there's more than one I, way. I, 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 yeah. I mean, with, with regard to, you know, things being too magic, um, for, for Malcolm's, I'm, and I'm going to talk a bit about this uh, from my perspective at um, the Cosmic Summit. What what Griggs showed there is that if your claims are too outlandish for most people to handle, you're literally going to hit a wall straight away. Right. No one's going to be interested in taking your technology forward. And the reality is, for me, what I want to see out of the thunderstorm generator is something that has actually already been proved for water injection systems for nearly 100 years. And that is cleaning up the burn, cleaning up the burn radically. Um, and that's something that the countries all over the world have been progressively forcing upon engine manufacturers with their emissions limits being reduced and reduced and reduced. And this forced different type of engine design, but it also forced the introduction of catalytic converters. Catalytic converters are not it's something... the wrong way to do it. Yeah. You cannot put the catalytic converter that costs $1,000 on a $1,000 rickshaw, right? Um, yeah. It's not going to happen. But you could put a $30 or $40 simplified uh, um, thunderstorm generator if it did what i believe in in my view is the most important thing which is ensuring that there's no hydrocarbons and carbon monoxide coming out that's what makes your eyes turn red and your nose and your eyes stream when you're in Ahmedabad, like i was but just before christmas uh um sharing some of the data with the indian community there for the thunderstorm generator and 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 the carbon monoxide is what's restricting malcolm's um sponsors from from you, you know being able to produce more energy and more profit from their installation so you know if, if it does produce magic which we, we, we may have got a hint with this carbon 14 data and there might be other data coming and you know my personal journey is with it oh it's got these coherent matter waves coming out i have to say i have to get involved i've got no choice now because i've seen these things in our, our lab in our work but I've also seen it in the GEET. So this probably means it's all lightning related. And then I say it's all lightning related. And if it is, there's going to be iron-rich crenelated microspheres. And oh my God, there's iron-rich crenelated microspheres. And now I can't stop, right? Because if there wasn't, then I could have probably stopped at that point. But <laughs> so, but the point is, that's pointing to something that's a little bit too difficult for people to comprehend. But if we can have a simple, if we can have a simple device and it says, this does basically what a catalytic converter does, but you don't have to burn 25,000 miles worth of gas to produce the platinum and rhodium that goes in there from mining, right? You can just take cheap steel and you can knock these things out and you can put them on a auto rickshaw or, or a tuk-tuk or whatever you like to call them and clean up those cities across Asia. It's going to profoundly affect the quality of life for hundreds of millions of people. And that, that for me, is is the big win. And, and, you know, we can learn from Briggs's experience. Don't overclaim. Deliver yeah. a product that delivers a real need uh, at a price that's affordable for any people that can't currently afford a solution. So Yeah, they can't stop. That's the other thing is it's like it's really the, you know, the Ashton Forbes side of things. He's going into free energy and all that. And, you know, they're going down the whole we've got an NDA and blah, blah, blah. And free energy. I mean. This is the approach, I think, which is like, hey, we're just going to make these off clear. For most people just looking at it, there's no stopping this technology. It's out there. I can make something like it. I mean, I don't need a plan. I don't need a damn patent. I've done it. And I mean, I'm doing it a little bit of a different way. But I mean, I'm going to hook one on my generator on my taco truck at some point and just start showing it off. I want to start maybe working with the fishermen. And, and you know, we gradually retrofit it just like they, you know, went and 
stuck their tentacles in and started steering everybody in the wrong direction. We can we can do the same thing. And there, and that that's why it's important that we have these meetings that everybody, you know, there's a there's scores of ways to do this. But you know, what's important is we're we're formulating a theory that we can all resonate on and and like, oh, I'm gonna use Yeah, I mean it's it's, it's, it's one, wonderful. When have, yeah, it's wonderful when you have an idea that predicts both future observations and past findings. <laughs> that, 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 that's going to be quite useful and, and across different systems. Anyway, thank you for sharing your experiences. I'm going to give to Gerald the, the window. Thanks for letting me chat. I'm out. Yeah, no real pleasure. It's always interesting to listen to you, Alex. Gerald. Yes, hello. So as to somebody who's uh, still learning, I'm just curious, when when you describe bluer water as Alex does, would that not be a form of Bremstrung radiation? Uh, and no, I think you're thinking of Cherenkov radiation, where you, you get like a, almost like you get on a, a uh, the, the thinking is it's a bit like the traveling sound boom, but it's a, like a light boom caused by uh, um, uh, high energy particles flying through a medium. So I, I don't, I don't think it's that. Uh, I don't think there's any Cherenkov radiation uh, produced because Cherenkov radiation, I think, is a bit blue. But I don't think it's that. There's, there's no high energy source at some point in there. No, I think, I think it's just, it's, it's about absorption and transmission of light from natural light sources. There is obviously a, a trans, a, an absorption of other wavelengths. And uh, blue is the remaining wavelength that gets through. Uh, now, if if you've ever done diving, yeah, uh, it's bit. the red lights that die first, which is why when you're snorkeling or you're scuba diving, everything's most colourful when you are in the first 10 metres of water. But as you start to go down, everything becomes increasingly bluer because of the absorption. Now, that would imply that you know there is already this kind of property of of allowing the higher frequency light to go deeper into water but um what blue water or blue steam is implying is that that process of absorbing uh, infrared and and green and and so forth light um and red light is is heightened um, so it, 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 it indicates to me that potentially there's been either structured water formed or, or the bond lengths or bond angles somehow are altered so that the absorption spectra uh, properties of the water are changed. And you could imagine that just like in deuterium catalyzed, sorry, uh, in muon catalyzed fusion, you have a heavy electron uh, and effectively in the muon. And that allows um, uh, a, uh, how should we put it? It allows the deuterium, deuterium to get close enough together so that they uh, will fuse. And, and in fact, in this room, um, I was absolutely stunned to find, uh, I can't, I know it's already packed in a bag, two huge volumes on muon catalyzed fusion uh, conferences from I think one was 1988 and one was 1991 or 1992 or three, you can see what would have been a huge problem in the announcement of Pons and Fleischmann for the muon catalyzed fusion. But I, I'm getting sidetracked. What I'm saying is that that muon is is so it's one one thousand nine hundred times heavier or whatever it is than a normal electron. Okay. Mm -hmm. Or whatever it is, it's it's a lot heavier, and so the bond length becomes a lot shorter, so they fuse. I imagine that oxygen seventeen is heavier, and so potentially it has a slightly different, you know, structure for the H two O, and that changes the absorption spectrum, so that to the eye, when you are looking at ordinary water, it appears blue. So that that is my hypothesis. It's either structured water nature. Or whatever, but it's because of some electron property um, that's going on. Well, well, now, now I'm even a hundred times more interested in this tech. Thanks for the answer, Bob. <laughs> that's all right. Yeah, it's a pleasure. 
Okay, so uh, Ken has said, uh, Bob Griggs, uh, that metals precipitate out of the water and are collected at the bottom of the tank. It would seem that the element transportation or synth synthesized elements are being made and circulated throughout the system. Yeah, yeah, that, that's what I'm saying. But he was also talking about taking dirty water that he, they know is highly metallized. And then he gave the example of, uh, of nickel plating wash banks where there's a high concentration of nickel ions in the water and somehow it collects these nickel ions and allows them to clump together to form out, fall out. Uh, the question becomes, is it a function of reflection of light or filtration of frequencies through the stream? So, yeah, yeah um, reflection, it could be reflection also. Uh, the thing about reflection is that it is the frequency of light that's not absorbed, 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 uh, if I get my worms right. Um, if it is a um, through diffraction or, or through um, passage through the water, then it is uh, um, a absorption or lack of absorption of the blue light. I, I think, given the fact that, yeah, I, I think given the fact that it really did look like lack of absorption in the Binger and Huang thing, and given the fact that both systems are cavitation, my gut feeling is Ken that this is a uh, lack of absorption rather than reflection. Um, I guess reflection is also lack, lack of absorption. It's like absorption and then re-emission. Um, so anyway, show says good night to everyone. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Does anyone else have any questions or comments? I can read your comment in the chat if you don't want to speak. If not, I will call it a night. Okay. Any plans on on making a pump? Uh, not at the moment. We've got a lot going on. Uh, uh, okay, Harry, far away. What's your question? Oh, that, that was it. <laughs> Any plans on making a pump? I have no plans on making a pump. Um, I would warn people that are considering making a pump you have evidence in this presentation by Griggs that there is some form of potential radiation coming out. I already have said very clearly, and you can go and see Shishkin's presentation uh, on a new form of penetrating radiation on the MFMP's YouTube site, that he said that exposure to his cavitation, water cavitator, making him feel sick, led him on his journey to... Uh, um, discover the emissions from his cavitator and he calculated that because of the energy involved in what they can do to materials that he observed he would suggest that one hour exposure to that would uh, kill someone and certainly the indications from the work of Leclerc and his colleague at, um, at Nanospire they got radiation sickness but then they 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 kind of pushed it of course we do know that there are emissions if you if you run something round and round and round as uh, Kladoff did and he observed both neutrons and um uh, other energy particles but that is likely because you're you're cycling it around and you're you'll keep you if you keep adding protons to something um then you're gonna have some point where you're going to have decays and that's just the reality and Leclerc said he observed you know very very heavy elements being synthesized and they do decay right any other questions if not I'm going to call it a night and thank you very much but thank you mostly to Takaaki Matsumoto um, for all of his saving of his uh, literature and for the saving of people's other literature. Okay, so I will see you in the next video. Thanks a lot, guys.